Hello, with this video lesson, we're just going to look a little bit at Darwin and his ideas behind his theories of natural selection. Now, keep in mind when we talk about a theory, a theory is a well-supported, testable explanation in the phenomena of the natural world. Basically, it's a hypothesis that's been tested over and over and over again, and you kind of keep getting the same answer. And the theory of evolution is this idea behind natural selection. And remember, evolution is basically a change in population over time. And most of the time, it's due to mutations. For example, this white rabbit doesn't know it's white. It is camouflaged with the snow, which means it hides from predators and it doesn't get eaten. So therefore, that gene has the chance to get passed from generation to generation. It doesn't ask to change. It doesn't ask to evolve. It's just a mutation that happens. And as the environment changes, the species can either adapt or go extinct. And again, the species doesn't say, oh, I need to adapt. Oh, global warming, there's not as much snow, I need to be brown. That's not what happens. It's just that the brown rabbits live in non-snowy areas better than the white rabbits do. And therefore, we call this an adaptation. This is an inherited characteristic that increases an organism's chances for survival. So for example, some adaptations these creatures have. We have this walking stick. It's an insect. It has no clue what it looks like. It doesn't know it looks like a stick. It doesn't even know what a stick is. It didn't say, hey, I want to be a stick. Nope. At some point in time, a creature was born with a mutation, and it may look like a stick. So therefore, it has the ability to camouflage. It doesn't know it's camouflaging. It just knows it's not getting eaten. Okay. Now, the father of evolution is considered to be Charles Darwin, and he did travel around the world for about five years on Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle. And during this time, he collected fossils and specimens of organisms that he found all over the world. And so this map kind of shows you this idea of all these different places that he went. But one place in particular really got him thinking. And this was the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands is a small cluster of islands off the coast of South America. And you can see that some of them, uh, there's Darwin, were named after him. Now, while in the Galapagos Islands, he was given freedom to kind of walk around. And he became very, very interested in the tortoises there. And you're like, okay, what's a tortoise? Well, turtles are saltwater creatures, terrapins are freshwater creatures, and tortoises tend to be land living creatures. But as he was going through the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that there were these different types of tortoises. And people could tell what island they came from based on their shell. Well, he was very interested in studying the tortoises, but the people on the ship were like, nope, we are not carrying all these on the ship. So he began to look at the different birds that were found there. And one of the birds that he studied were these finches, because finches are pretty much found in a lot of places on Earth. And so he was very interested in how this bird that's very similar to birds that he grew up with in England could also be found on the other side of the world. So he began to collect different species of finches. And he noticed that finches on different islands had different types of beaks. Now, where the beaks can give you an idea of what that bird feeds off of. Well, if you think about plate tectonics and the volcanism creation of islands, at one point in time, the Galapagos Islands were probably really close to the mainland, and it was close enough that the birds could maybe fly back and forth. However, over time, these birds became isolated on this island, and mutations began to show up. And some mutations worked better than others. That's the whole idea behind natural selection, by the way. So Darwin hypothesized that these finches had started as one species, but had migrated to the islands and adapted to the environments over a period of time. Now, again, they didn't say, hey, I need to adapt. But let's just say a storm blew um, a bunch of birds over to the island. And the islands are far enough away that they can't fly back home. But just due to the wind of the storm, they ended up on this island. Well, over time, they have babies. And some of those babies might be born with mutations. And those mutations might have made their beaks a little bit different. Well, since their beaks are a little bit different, they can eat different foods. Well, that actually lessens the competition. So this bird was born with a mutation. They gave it this type of beak. While this bird was born with a mutation, they gave it a different type of beak. And so nature said, okay, well, let's see what happens. What can you eat? And so by having these different shaped beaks, they were able to eat different things. So that actually lessened competition. Well, if you lessen competition, 
you're more likely to survive. You have plenty of food, you can reproduce, and these traits get passed down over time. So this is this idea, as you can see here, that we call adaptive radiation. When you radiate, you know, you spread out and it's dealing with adaptation. So this is also what we call divergent evolution. Okay. To diverge means to split. So this idea that we would later call adaptive radiation or divergent evolution is this idea that we have a common ancestor. But over time, due to mutations, we end up with creatures that are different enough that we have to give them different species names. Now, just some common beliefs during Darwin's time. A lot of people believe that the Earth was only a few thousand years old, and this is based on biblical reference. There are scholars who have taken the Bible and just based on the information the Bible have calculated how old the world actually was according to the Bible. And it only has it as a few thousand years old. However, we know that the Earth is at least 4.6 billion years old based on, based on data that evolutionists have gathered. Most people believe that neither the planet nor the species that inhabited it had changed since the beginning of time. Remember a very religious society and they believe that God created the earth in seven days and this was how it was created. However, there were challenges to these beliefs. During Darwin's time, many fossils were being discovered which challenged the idea that plants and animals had not changed since the earth was formed. Now, two people, Hutton and Lyle, came up with this idea that is now called gradualism. Now, you know that gradual means slowly over a period of time. Well, Hutton and Lyle use this term gradualism to talk about the changes in earth, not necessarily creatures, but the idea that the earth has changed over time. We have volcanoes, we have earthquakes, we have plate tectonics, we have erosion, and this happens slowly, hence the term gradualism. So this did help scientists recognize that the Earth might be older than previously thought. Now, there was also Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Now, he actually published his work before Darwin was born. And he is one of the first scientists who's credited with actually recognizing that species changed over time. Now, when you hear about what he thought, it actually sounds kind of ridiculous. Think about your mom telling you, if you keep making that face, it's gonna get stuck like that. Well, that is the whole idea behind Lamarck's theories behind evolution. He believed that organisms actually meant to change. He believed that organisms could make themselves changed. And he believed that organisms changed in order to reach what that organism thought of as, as, if I can talk, as perfection. He argued that organisms could acquire or lose certain traits during their lifetime by use or disuse. It actually came on to be called what we call acquired characteristics. You know, if you acquire something, you gain it. Well, this was how he believed species changed over time. That, for example, the giraffe is the common example that's given with this. So here are these group of horse-like creatures. And they lived in an area, there, maybe there was a drought, so there wasn't a lot of grass, but there were these trees way up high that were really bushy. And so according to Lamarck, these creatures, if they tried hard enough, could actually stretch their neck and each time it would get longer and longer and longer until they could reach the leaves on the trees. And the creatures could keep their necks like that. So the creatures acquired those characteristics. It would be like you um, constantly changing your hair color. You might have blonde hair and you constantly make it dark, or you might have dark hair and you constantly bleach it. Well, it would get to the point where your hair would just stay that color. We know that that doesn't happen. But this was a pretty widely accepted viewpoint back in the day. So he thought that these acquired traits could be passed on to the offspring. And over time, this would change and cause a change in the species. Another gentleman who was writing at, the same, at this time was Thomas Malthus. And he basically argued that if the human population continued to grow at higher rates, Sooner or later, there wouldn't be enough space and food for everyone. Well, we now know that that is true. But back then, they were like, no way. You know, we have plenty of land. We have plenty of space. But as you now know, the world has reached over 7 billion people. And you know that there are areas in the world where they do have to deal with drought. They do have to deal with the lack of food. They do have to deal with um, 
poor hygiene causing diseases in you know highly populated areas. But back in Darwin's day, this was laughed at. Well, Darwin then decided to take his writings and publish what is called the theory of natural selection and, or excuse me, the origin of species based on his theory of natural selection. And this was written in 1859. And while he was studying his ideas, he did work with a gentleman named Alfred Wallace. And Alfred Wallace actually came up with ideas similar to his, but Darwin finished his book quickly so that he could produce, he could get his book published first so he would get all the credit. And in this book, he talks about this idea that he calls natural selection. And if you think about it, the name makes sense. Nature is going to select what works best. So for example, if you live in a desert, you're not gonna to wanna to be a bright pink because you can't hide. So nature's gonna select creatures that blend in. They're gonna be the ones that don't get eaten. If you live in the snow, it makes sense to be white. Nature will select the white gene. So species change over time because of changes in environment. And again, these creatures don't say, hey, I want to change. Just creatures that have certain genetic makeups are more likely to survive. So therefore, they're the ones that are gonna pass down that gene. And so nature has selected them because they fit best in the environment. So natural selection, those best adapted to the environment are more likely to survive. And again, the creatures don't say, oh, I need to adapt. It's all based on mutations and genetic makeup. In natural selection, he does talk about the struggle for existence. There is going to be competition. Members of species compete for food, space, and other necessities. So there will be what you guys have always heard of as survival of the fittest. Now, fittest doesn't mean that you're strong. Fittest means do you fit into the environment? So those best adapted to the environment are the more likely the ones to survive. So for example, we have these um, leopards. Notice their fur color is very similar to the environment around them. They fit in. You wouldn't want a you know, bright orange or you know, a, a bright pink creature in this environment. They would not fit in. They would not blend in. They would not survive. So over long periods of time, natural selection did cause a change in the characteristics of a population. New traits are created by mutations. This bug here has no clue what it looks like. Remember, most animals don't know what they look like. You can look in a mirror. You know what you look like. Most creatures have no idea what they look like. This creature doesn't know it looks like a leaf. It just knows it lives in a tree and nothing eats it. Okay. This was a mutation. At some point in time, this creature was born and it look like a leaf and it just happened to be living in an area that had leaves so it just happened to be able to blend in and keep in mind populations evolve individuals do not now it starts with one individual something has a mutation and nature's like oh this is interesting let's check it out let's see let's watch what happens so that mutation gets passed down now if the mutation does not fit the environment you know that nature's going to kill it off but if it fits the environment, it helps that creature survive, then eventually it's gonna get passed through that population to the point where it, this population has changed enough to be called a different type of species. So Darwin suspected that all species present on Earth had once begun as one species. Evolutionists believe that we all started off as bacteria at some point in time. And through that time, from bacteria, we got these creatures called protists. And from protists, we got plants, we got animals, and we got fungi. So through a series of adaptations over millions of years, we have all diverged into a species present today. So when we talk about adaptive radiation or divergent evolution, to diverge, remember, means to split apart. So over millions of years, we've all split apart and become different species. He also used the term descent with modification, like you're a descendant, okay? but you have changed over time. A classic example is this creature called the peppered moth. And so we have the typica, which is the typical peppered moth. This is its normal color. And then we have the carbonara, which is darker in color. 
Well, during the, in England, the Typica moth is the most common colored moth. And it actually matches the color of the bark on different trees there. But during the Industrial Revolution, a lot of ash fell on forests and caused the forest to darken. So therefore, the lighter colored moth is more difficult to spot in a normal situation looking at normal trees. So I don't know if you can see in this picture, but right here, let me use a different color, right here is the peppered lighter colored moth. It's very easy to see the darker colored moth. So if you were a bird flying overhead, you would swoop down and eat the darker colored moth. And because the lighter colored moth is blending in. So therefore, the lighter color moth fits that environment better. However, in a region where the trees have been burned, you can see that the darker color moth is going to fade in better. And again, populations evolve, individuals do not.